our last session for today is going to be a panel uh, speaking about execution. So we talk a lot about all of these great ideas, but how do we actually get to the point where we can execute and actually make them drive the results that we need in business? So I'm going to turn this over to Andrew Field, our CEO at PFL. He's going to moderate the panel. We've got a great group he's going to introduce to them. But before we do that, I'm going to pop up a Dilbert. So in the 14 years that I've worked for Andrew, we've sat side by side many times. And I walk in in the morning and I usually have a Dilbert cartoon laying on my desk that has some kind of hidden message. And I often think, is this about me or is this about everybody else? But uh, he's definitely a fan of Dilbert. So this is a, a Dilbert that will represent what they're going to be talking about today. So welcome. Thank you. Uh, I don't think I need a clicker. Hi again, everybody. This has been really awesome. I'm really, I'm really enjoying this. I'm glad I came. Um, <laughs> and, and I'm glad all of you came. So uh, Catherine, a little while ago, was talking about thought diversity as a driver of innovation. And I thought that was really good. I've always believed in it and that diversity is more than skin deep. And so she showed, I don't know if that was DISC or Insights, but the personality profile. And we have always found that having teams with diverse personalities and diverse ways of processing information and experiencing the world is really helpful for not only innovation, but for execution. And that's the subject of this panel. People talk a lot about building a culture of innovation, and that's great, innovation matters. But there have been many great quotes about the ratio between innovation and execution, and having an idea, and bringing the idea to fruition, to reality, We've all heard, I can go back as far as I think I have, uh, Ben Franklin, well done is better than well said. And um, Mary Kay Ash, ideas are a dime a dozen. People who implement them are priceless. Thought that was a nice one. And um, the old one, I think it's attributed to Edison, but it might be incorrectly, that success is 1% inspiration, 99% perspiration. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. I have one more person who had some thoughts on inspiration versus perspiration, and it's Gary Vaynerchuk of Vaynerchuk Media. We're going to just listen to him for about 90 seconds. We could probably sit here for the next two hours, draw them all out, record them, and predict the next 78 great startups over the next nine years. And? Beginning. Start at the beginning, please. That's where it started. Oh. Okay, go, go, ahead, go ahead and run it. Actually, I'll... Oh, oh, we can probably oh, sit oh, here oh, for the oh, next oh. two hours. Hold on, hold on. I'll go ahead and say the first part. So the first part was, he says, I get ideas all the time. People send ideas into us, and they ask us to sign an NDA. And he says, I have a great assistant. She has a form letter that says, bleep you. And he goes on to say that ideas are... Uh, common, they're all over the place, but it's not the most important part. And then right here he starts in and says that uh, we could probably list a bunch of ideas and invent all the next great companies, but most of them won't happen. So now we can go ahead and finish it. We could probably sit here for the next two hours, draw them all out, record them, and predict the next 78 great startups over the next nine years. And so I think the thing that is another theme in entrepreneurship is there is way too much fodder brought to the idea. Uber was Magic Cab three years earlier. Uber is not an idea, Uber existed. It's called Magic Cab. But the guys that executed it sucked, so they lost. So I think, you know, if there's any level of romance left in this room about your idea, I'd like to suffocate it. Because I think the actual situation is what you actually do with it. All right, so Gary likes to be provocative. I've asked the group here to be as provocative as they like. Let's start, this shouldn't be too controversial. Could you introduce yourselves, please, starting with John? John Funk. Say more? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, first half of my career was an internet entrepreneur. Um, had a couple of good successes. Uh, second half of the career, uh, been working in consumer products on uh, innovations between inventors and small companies and big companies. And then most recently I've started a uh, uh, investment fund. Great, Morgan. Hi, I'm Morgan Hauser. I'm a Montana native and an MSU grad. Go Cats, woohoo! Uh, 
I started my career about six years ago when I graduated from college. I worked for some uh, technical companies during college, which really led the way for what I wanted to do afterwards. I did some time at nonprofit and decided that wasn't really my gig. Um, four and a half years ago, I joined Elixir as a second employee. We now have 35. We are a consulting agency that focuses on a marketing automation platform called Marketo, and I hope you've heard of it. And if you need help, come call us. Well, hi, my name is Will Price. I'm a partner with Next Frontier Capital. Uh, we're a fund based here in Bozeman. We'd like to uh, focus on co uh, companies that create impact, utility, and meaning, and bring equity to Montana, which has been uh, a place with uh, not a lot of venture capital historically. Before that, I spent 15 years as a uh, two-time CEO and worked for a few venture firms. So uh, what, one of the things I like doing the most is, is working with people who have great ideas, but also have the, the grit and determination to, to make them happen. So. Okay, Susan. Hi, I'm Susan Carstensen. I'm a fifth generation Montanan. I'm on the board of PFL. Um, spent the last 30, 30 years in business. Um, most recently, it was the interim CEO at a tech company in Utah, and before that, I spent 12 years as a CFO and COO at Right Now Technologies. And when I first saw the panel invitation, I saw the word, you know, innovating or innovation, and I was kind of like, I don't know why they really want me to talk about that. But then when they talked about execution, I'm like, okay, this makes sense. There you go. And, uh, it, you know, innovation seems more sexy. Having a great idea seems more sexy. But if you look at some of the greats, like a Steve Jobs, I mean, uh, it was a phone. And there actually were smartphones before that that texted and that sort of thing. But the details and the execution, how they did it and how they transformed an industry and the deals he did, even going back to the iPod, the deals he did with the music companies transformed an industry or two. And the deals he did with the telecoms transformed an industry or two. And, and that's execution. Because if anyone's ever tried to do deals with big companies, it's really hard, uh, as, as we at PFL are now finding out. Um, so I want to lead off with a question, and generally we'll ask different questions of different people and then see who wants to chime in. But uh, Will, you're an investor, as is John. So tell me about the best idea you thought was a good idea, and maybe still do think is a good idea, that you either did and did, didn't invest in, but then flopped due to lack of execution. Yeah, I, so I, I was, we talked about this earlier, so I was able to think about it, and we invested in a company called Move Networks, which was based in, uh, in Orem and Provo, Utah, uh, about 10 years ago. And what Move did is they, they were the first to really do live streaming of events. Uh, and they, they had the ABC and ESPN contract, so if you used to watch ESPN, you could watch a live soccer game from Europe. They were using the, the Move technology. At the time, the competitor was Adobe, and they had a, the flash streaming, and their product was charged about 52 cents a gig to stream content. And Move used a, a variable bandwidth technology that determined on how, what kind of bandwidth, what kind of device you're on, they would adjust the amount of data they'd stream, and they were about seven or eight cents. Uh, it was a great reference account, uh, great team technology, and they ended up raising about $72 million from Benchmark, Cisco, Microsoft. Uh, a couple things happened. The first is that Adobe took their prices from 52 cents to two cents, which we had no, no idea that they had that kind of elasticity and to be able to reduce prices and, and essentially went, uh, we thought, oh, we're gonna be able to smoke on price and quality and they just took the price right to the floor because they knew we had better quality. And the second thing is I think the team started uh, with $72 million in the bank. Uh, I remember one time coming out of a investor conference in New York and there's this giant limo waiting on the side and they had the name of the CEO in the window. And so I think, uh, in other words, they, they started operating like they already Microsoft in term, or Cisco in terms of spend. And so the combination, I think, of, of uh, a spend that got away from them and also really underestimating the competitive response from a real strong player, the company went out of business. Uh, so I was certain it would be a public company, a very successful business, just given the pedigree, the technology, and the customer base they had. But uh, I think both of those factors uh, led to their doom. So that's the one I would talk about. All right, Morgan, I'm going to jump to you. So you're operational in a business. Tell us about something at Elixir, which is five years old? Yes. Okay, tell us about something at Elixir that you guys all thought was a great idea, but somehow it flopped on execution. And maybe tell us what executional tip you learned in the process. Uh, so like I said, we're a consulting agency focusing on one marketing automation platform. There was a time we decided we didn't want to put all of our eggs in one basket. 
like most people, we wanted to diversify. So we tried a couple other platforms and tried to support clients using those, and we realized we didn't have as in-depth knowledge on those other platforms, and we're not going to be as successful because we didn't understand them as well as we understood Marketo. So for that reason, we focused in. Uh, we probably made that decision two, three years ago, team. They're all sitting right here. <laughs> um, and with that, we've had a lot of success focusing and really um, zeroing in on what we need to focus uh, for that particular platform. But with that, we've realized there's so many things you could do, and there's so many opportunities out there that you could expand your company into uh, new markets, into new products, and things like that. But it's also important to focus on the things that are working and grow those as well. So that's what we've learned. Okay, so what I'm hearing there is the importance of saying no. Yes. All right, so who here thinks they're really good at saying no? Raise your hand. Who thinks you're terrible at saying no as a company? Yeah, that is the tyranny of bright ideas. It, it, it really is. We have a lot of bright people, and we have a lot of bright ideas, and we, to this day, after talking about this for 20 years, to this day, we struggle to focus and say no to a perfectly good idea that we don't have the capacity to execute on. John? Yeah, I, I think that's uh, definitely the, the biggest challenge. So do you want me to go with the saying no, or do you want me to go with no, we want to hear flopped? Flop. No, we want to hear flopped. Oh, darn it. I almost <laughs> escaped. Um, so it hasn't flopped yet, um, but it's, it's, it's going sideways. So um, I recall that we did a, a lot of work. I had a couple partners um, in a business that was basically taking new consumer products uh, that weren't yet on the market with the idea that we could make them better um, and then license them to a big company. And we came up with a, uh, or an inventor came up with a trash bag that stands up by itself. Um, it kind of ships as a pizza box and you snap it open and it stands up and it's, it's really cool. It's like a magic trick. Um, and we did all the research and consumers were like, this is really cool. We love this. Um, and so we convinced ourselves we had a $100 million business on our hands. And, um, and then Hefty and Glad said, you know, gosh, all our research confirms that it's really a great idea. We just don't know how to make it. And uh, so we said, well, we'll figure out how to make it. And so we launched the product thinking, well, we've had the idea. We actually know how to make it. Um, and all the consumers tell us it's going to be big. So uh, we kind of forgot about marketing and awareness because um, we thought the product would sell itself. And so we didn't really execute, uh, we didn't raise enough money to raise the awareness because it's a product that you have to see uh, in order to, uh, to really understand. And you're not really thinking about your trash solutions um, when you're wandering through the grocery store. So um, this is another one of these latent problems that uh, isn't, uh, SEO doesn't help you on this because nobody searches for a trash bag that stands up. So we're still working on it. Um, it's coming along, but it's, uh, it's not a big, I'm, I'd be in Hawaii right now if it worked. So Susan, you, you're a uh, seasoned technology executive and as a board member, you get exposure to a lot of tech companies. How common is it, before I get your flop story, how common is it uh, that people in the technology world are in love with their idea and don't put much attention on the sales and marketing side of it because they think, I'm going to build a better mousetrap and people are just going to snap it up. Oh, ab absolutely. That happens all the time. They think it's the, the very best thing or that the very best product wins, but it, it's everything around it in terms of the go-to-market and the execution that, that matters. All right. So let's hear your story about something. Flop story. I, str flop I struggled story. with this one because... It, all of the, I would say all of my investments are so recent that nobody's flopped yet. But if I, if I look back a little bit uh, at right now, we made three different acquisitions and I'm not gonna say which one, but one of them um, we absolutely flopped on and it was because of a lack of ex execution on it. Planning, getting the t team involved, setting out what we were trying to really achieve. We, l we learned some huge lessons on it. So who knows the stat that you hear bandied about, about the failure rate of M&A, in, even in public companies, where they say X percent fail to add any shareholder value, and the majority, in fact, detract? Does anyone know those numbers? I think it's close to three quarters, 75 percent, I, I think. Yeah. I think you're right. Yeah, yeah so. It's about, it's, about, it's about, there we go, it's about 80 percent of new products fail. Um, 
that are introduced. But that can't possibly be because great companies like a Procter & Gamble, they know how to do consumer packaged goods. How can they possibly have an 80% failure rate? Well, they don't do much. They only do one or two products you know, a year. So it's, it's when you look broadly across industry. Um, and many of their new products, they're just adding lime, right? There's, you know, here's an existing product, and it's, today's, it's this year's new flavor. We're going to count it as a new product. That doesn't count. All right. So I knew there was a reason I invited you on this panel. Um, oh, I would like somebody who, who can address this. At the time uh, Google came into existence, uh, well, I, I know that in 1999, we were an early customer of theirs, and back when they only did CPM rather than cost per click, model and we talked them into doing cost per click for us so we could work backwards to a cost per acquisition. It was, it, it was pretty sweet. That was the time when they only had 60 employees. And, um, but prior to that, we, and the reason we did that is we were using goto.com, which was an early pay per click and then it became Overture, then it got bought by Yahoo. And if you think about it, at the time the big search engines were AltaVista and, and I, I think Yahoo was doing search at that time, um, and Overture was coming on strong and Dogpile. So everybody was building search engines. Dozens, if not hundreds of companies were building search engines. What is it about Google that made it now 63% market share the dominant search engine? Well, there's a great slide deck on the web. It's uh, Reid Hoffman's LinkedIn Series B slide deck, which he, he published and he goes through every slide. But, what he talked about was the difference uh, using network technologies and network uh, thinking to come up with better results, uh, the difference between you know, Hoover's versus LinkedIn, for example. And he talks about search a lot. And in hindsight, this is somewhat obvious, but he talked about Lycos, AltaVista, Yahoo. They're all basically flat directories where they looked at each page in isolation and essentially would do a, a word count, almost like the way you do an index in the back of a book. How many times they mentioned the word civil war in this one document, but the document was viewed as an atomic element without the broader network being involved. The page rank index didn't really care what the page said, it really cared about what other pages said about that page in terms of backlinks. And so uh, it, the, uh, the relevance was defined really not just much in this one document, but all the other documents out there, how they're connected to it, and, and what headers and what terms they use to express that. And so I think he took a problem and completely turned it on his head and where people were living in a world where they were doing a basically old-fashioned you know, semantic natural language processing. Um, he was able to, entity extraction, things like that, uh, he was able to come out from a very different way. And I think the other thing they were able to do, given the go-to experience, was that at the time, I don't know if you remember that, but the whole concept of purity of search results was a huge issue. And the idea of biasing a result for money was considered a, you know, an anathema. And I think the other companies, because they came out of an academic background in search, uh, were very reluctant to commercialize search or, or, or think about how to test commercializing of search. And I think the combination of his network-driven uh, thinking about what relevance, what, how do you calculate relevance, and also the willingness to follow go-to and, and think about different ad models, um, I, 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 that, I, that to me is, explains a little bit about how they were able to break through because it was a very unique and novel approach. Okay, surprise question here. Don't ask me one like that. Um, <laughs> I was 11, so. Okay, yeah. <laughs> she, was the, she was 11 the year we spent $600,000 on Google. That's great. Um, what was the first product ever advertised on Google? You guys first, and then we'll open up to the audience. Wasn't it lobsters in Maine? Boom. Very good. <laughs> wow. Lobsters in Maine. Ryan Bartholomew, who is now a Bozeman resident, did that. Huh? He went Spinal Jeopardy on that one. Yeah, that's a, that's a good one. What is Lobsters and Mates? Yeah, that was, that was good. All right, so let's talk about... I, I, I'm fascinated by culture, and we were talking about culture earlier today. And I'm fascinated because one of the definitions is culture is the unwritten rules that everybody knows exist for how people work together in a workplace. And... There are clearly places where you can go, I'm sure we can all think of a restaurant or something, where the culture is clearly one where sloppiness and poor execution is acceptable. Whether it's, oh, it's four o'clock and we don't have a room ready for you to check into yet or something like that. Wh whatever it might be, uh, a lot of startup restaurants are not that focused on execution. So if there's a culture that says, trying's good enough, 
or you know, 80% is good enough or something like that. On the one hand, you can say, let's break things and try things and fail fast and all that. But on the other hand, certainly in our business, we're doing repeatability. And if people are relying on us to trigger the send of something in the real world from their software, it can't maybe go out. It can't probably go out. It has to go out. And if they're relying on us to post that information back into their Salesforce so that somebody can make that actionable for them, it has to happen. It can't probably happen, maybe happen, we want to happen. We tried to make it happen, that doesn't work. So I'd like to talk about some tips for building a culture of execution. And Susan, I think you, I, I know you're qualified to talk on that one. Thank you. In terms of the culture of execution, it is the uh, non-shiny object work, right? It, it, it's, it is repeating things. It's like, okay, what is, what is the strategy once you have it? It's like you put it there, you have a framework for decision making, you know, you've got your KPIs, you've got your, you know, execution plans, it's the project, but it's just sticking with it over and over and over. I mean, it isn't any fun to, you know, to review your, I mean, we did weekly, I did weekly metrics every Friday for 13 years. Mm. Did I like doing weekly metrics every Friday for 13 years? No. But... You know, you just get into those habits and patterns and, and it flows all the way down and you connect the dots for, you know, it, it also is way easier in a really small organizations because you're all right there and you can all talk to each other. As you get larger and larger, connecting the dots on every element of the plans and, and the expectations and the strategies and the roles, you, you just have to stick it out. So how do you get, you know, you, were, you have the big title, you're the CFO and then the COO. How do you get that? more broadly throughout the organization? How do you know that at the sub-level, this group is doing their week weekly metrics every Friday? You know, you, you, you set up the processes. You ask people. You know, you, 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 you lead by example. You make sure your teams are doing it. You talk to them about, you know, what kind of feedback are they getting from their terms, teams. Um, you know, we didn't set up grand, you know, inspection cycles, but, but we certainly set up the expectations and just, again, stuck and repeated. Did it over again and did it over again. All right, who else has a good tip for us on uh, setting up a culture of execution? Well, I mean, I'll, I'll echo that in some sense. I mean, you, you probably all heard the phrase, you get what you measure. So, you know, you, you figure out what it is that is, are the core drivers of the outcomes that you want to focus your teams on. And, and you measure those drivers. Um, you know, in some of the companies that I've run, uh, you know, there are people that are really good at the bright, shiny object stuff. They're, you know, you give them a challenge, you say, I don't know how the heck we do this, but could you try to figure that out? And you, you, but you, you kind of wall those people off from the ones that are doing the day-to-day -day making the bread. Um, because they tend to break things because that's what they do. Um, and that's how they figure out the next generation. But you don't want them in the operations room when you're trying to send out the mail. Because um, they might try something in the middle of a run that, did, that doesn't work. Um, but they'll be like, well, boy, that can be an idea. So I'm going to try something else. And again, you, you kind of want to reward that without screwing up the well, day to day. Well, that begs the question. Because if, when I think of you, I think of a serial entrepreneur. Um, and some serial entrepreneurs really do go chase after the shiny thing. And so, John, as, as a shiny thing chaser, how, how do you manage to have the discipline to, to 13 years of every Friday? I hire somebody like her. Okay. <laughs> right? There you go. You're right. you, know, you're, you know your weaknesses, and um, uh, you know the kind of people to surround yourself with. I mean, that's, that goes back to diversity, uh, and it goes back to balancing your team out um, and figuring out uh, what you're good at and what you're bad at. Um, so my first company, uh, I was very politely handed the reins of being chairman uh, as I was being introduced to the new CEO. Um, <laughs> and uh, we forged a great relationship, um, and I learned a lot about um, what I was good at. I'm really good at taking a hill and getting people to climb on my back while we take it together. I wasn't, in my first career, first job, wasn't very good at doing the Friday meetings, but I got better at that. I mean, people learn. Uh, but then you got to decide, do you want to be good at a lot of things or great at something and have somebody else on your team be great at something you're not great at and together you create something wonderful? So in, in your intro, I should have said 
ousted former CEO, John Fonk? I prefer to just do that myself. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I, I remember working out with a guy. He said, uh, you know, it takes 17 days to form a habit and three days to fall out of it. And so it's so easy to, to, to lose track of the habit. And I wrote down the same word, habit and rhythm. And uh, I think that's one of the reasons that people really like using the Agile process. It, it's prescriptive, you know, uh, daily stand-ups. But one of the questions I ask companies to get a sense of where they are in that is what's their release management process like? I mean, that's a software question. But if you get a question, if you get the answer is, well, we release when we kind of feel like we should or uh, we don't have one or, you know, then you know you're in big, big trouble. And, and that's exactly a, 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 an interesting question because... A lot of developers feel like, well, you know, uh, how do you be creative if you're in this constrained prescriptive development process? And, and so breaking the, the connection between creativity or a feature and then a release is something that I think you see really disciplined teams be able to do. They're going to release every Tuesday at 1 o'clock. If it's ready, it's going to go out. If it's not, it won't go out. Um, and I, I think exactly as Susan said, habit, rhythm, uh, a framework, even if maybe you don't love the framework itself, just picking one and sticking to it, you'll be way better off. And you know, Andrew said, well, what about some controversial ideas? You know, so Agile's all the rage in software development. And I don't know if you guys read Peter Thiel's book, Zero to One, but he says it's one of the worst things that's happened to software and technology because we end up with incrementalism. You know, if you're releasing every week, you're thinking about next week. And I think Devin talked earlier about thinking 10 years out. So how do you really marry truly disruptive thinking and ideas. He says you don't get a Tesla from an Agile process. You know, you don't get something really that's uh, non-contextual. Um, and so I think going back to your question is that if, if you have the shiny object person on your staff and you've got the operators who make the, wheel, the trains run on time, how do you get the best of both worlds without either uh, limiting the ability for the shiny object people to really pursue fantastic ideas or you just enter, enter chaos into the system where the people that rely on structure feel unbounded, and, and I think that's a real challenge. That's great. Uh, anybody else give us some tips for building that culture of execution I, in, a, in a professional services firm? <laughs> yes, yeah, so I think it's really important to have the people who, no matter what tasks you're going to give them, will take pride in their work. I think it starts from the hiring process to begin with and putting people in positions to leverage their strengths but know that although they have to do the same thing over and over again, they know who they're doing it for, why they're doing it, and the impact they're making, and they will take pride in what they're doing and keep doing it, knowing it's gonna get them to a different level in the organization to take on the next big project. I, I am really big on the frameworks concept because you, you have to, in my, in my view, the most successful organization, decisions are made at the lowest possible level. And so if they've got the framework for making the decisions, they know the KPIs, you know, you're hiring for the right talent, you really can harness a tremendous amount of energy and momentum to move forward. So this is, this is along the same veins. Um, one of the things I don't like about the universe as a person running a business is the law of entropy. And in physics, it's described as the gradual descent into disorder. And the example I always use is, if you put a house, if you build a house out there and just let it sit and do no maintenance, in 100 or so years, it'll be a pile of rubble on the ground. If you put a pile of rubble out there and put no energy into it, in 100 years, it will not be a house. And the thing is, you set something up and you think you have a good system for whatever it might be, and if you don't keep spinning that plate, if you don't keep putting energy into that system, it gradually de declines into disorder. And to me, that's the opposite of a uh, great execution culture. So specifically to combating entropy, any bright ideas here? And this is really more for me, you guys can listen in. <laughs> You know, I, I would say, I mean, and, and part of it's a personal trait of mine, it's like I think things can always be better. So it's like if you pick your, picture your house there, you're going to paint it, you're going to put up some shutters, you're going to put up Christmas lights. Things can always be better. And so challenging the team and in the entire organization, you know, because, it, it, you know, you can, you can always learn and you can always be better. And so it keeps it interesting and changing. All right. So you'll that's have, You'll have a mansion on the hill. Yeah, that's interesting. So instead of just set it and forget it, if you, build, if you can build a culture of continuous improvement, is what I'm hearing, if you build a culture of continuous improvement in the attempt to improve it, you will be putting energy into each of those systems, which will combat the entropy. Okay, that's a good learning there. Anything else on, on combating entropy? 
you know, I'm a big fan of, of uh, storytelling and narrative and, and vision, and the world's changing around you. I mean, if you feel like you can set yourself up one time and just spin that same plate, uh, you're going to get disrupted and somebody's going to eat your lunch because the world's moving. And part of the job of the CEO and the management team is to figure out not just where we are today, but where we're going tomorrow. So going back to your point about, you know, having that reflective time to get a little disruptive change, a little non-incremental change. And your job is to help your team understand where they're going um, and give them some new challenges, give them some fresh challenges and some fresh metrics. Um, you know, hey, we, you know, our customers aren't sending as much as they should, or hey, we, we seem to be doing the same types of campaigns time after time. Let's change that up. So, you know, throw some puzzles uh, in the mix. So here's one. Um, I'm gonna put this to Morgan first. When I think about execution, I think about the systems and the software often that we use to execute, whether it's Slack, Asana, Jira, Basecamp, Trello. What are your systems for people and their execution in your company? Uh, so you use a knowledge base that all employees add new content to on a daily basis. It's called Bloomfire. Uh, it's called what? Bloomfire. Okay. Um, I think it's actually a sales enablement tool as well. Um, but we use it inside of our company to um, list all of the things we've learned, ask questions, engage with one another throughout the day. If we can't find the answer on the Marketo community or someone hasn't um, experienced it, they know there are 35 other consultants they can reach out to in our organization. And instead of just chatting or emailing team at elixir.com to ask a question, um, we've implemented the knowledge base Bloomfire where they can reach out, get immediate help if someone has some downtime or has two seconds to answer their question because they've accomplished that project 20 times before and it's someone else's first time. So we found that product to be really helpful in engaging the workforce and helping people execute on a day-to-day -day basis. We use project management software called Function Point. We're working on a replacement, maybe Workfront, we don't know. <laughs> um, but those are the, the two primary uh, softwares we use on a day-to-day -day basis aside from Marketo. Uh, we heard a big endorsement from Matt, and I didn't know that's what uh, Matt Hines was going to be talking about, was the whole getting things done system. It really is amazing, and there's some really nice online training that you can get for it. I mean, of course, read the book, but there's some good online training you can get for it from Ninth House. They run you through a whole uh, training for it, and it's extremely helpful. You know, what's interesting is, regarding that and personal systems, is that when you're young and your life is simple, you don't really need a system. You can run everything out of your brain. So your first day of college, you carry your schedule around for about a week, and then you throw it away because it's all right there, and you don't need a system to remember there's a party at John's house Saturday night. Okay? It just comes naturally. But at, at some point, the, the line of the complexity of your life, now you have a job with more significant responsibilities and then family life and all these other things, community life. Meanwhile, the inevitable cognitive decline occurs, and at some point, those two lines cross, <laughs> And at that point, you need a system. And, uh, you know, so there is a whole thing about GTD for kids in high school and that sort of thing, but they don't, it isn't, it isn't broadly taught. So that is, that is one tip for execution because they say that the stress doesn't come from having more to do than you have time because that's true of all of us. There's always another ski run. There's always another river to float. There's always another book to read. So there's always something more to do than you have time to do. The stress comes from the gnawing sense of anxiety thinking that something is slipping through the cracks and thinking that, oh, I have to remember, what was it I was supposed to pick up on the way home? It's that, or more importantly, what important business thing did I leave undone today that I'm not even aware I left undone? So if you don't have trusted systems, it's a real problem for execution. So who wants to pick up on that? Systems, trusted systems? It's, 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 a, little, it's a little bit on topic and a little, little bit off, but... One of, one of the things I worry about with execution and kind of systems is how reliant we are all on systems as opposed to, you know, direct conversation and communication. I mean, I, you know, I took this uh, interim CEO job for four months, right? I have no idea. I had a phone in my office, and I never got a call. I don't even know what my number was. Nobody, nobody's picking up the phone. Nobody's calling anybody, and, and everybody... In a, in a ton of different meetings, you know, everybody would be sitting there with their computer open. You can't tell who's paying attention. And anyway, that's what I'm worried about with execution going forward, is how we do communicate well. 
How often did people walk into your office? Not very. Man. I walked, um, I walked into a lot of people's offices, though. Okay, so, yeah, I, the, I mean, to the extent that I'm going to contribute, I think face-to-face -face communication, the uh, gazelles.com guy, Vern Harnish, he says being in one building or having the vast majority of your people in one building is a competitive advantage. Obviously, eventually, if you're successful enough, you can't. You're, then it becomes the Microsoft campus, then it's worldwide. But if you can, the longer you can stay in one building and have face-to-face -face and spontaneous rather than email wars going back and forth, and, and I know that helps us, and it, it, it is challenging because the interruption level, not even counting email, the interruption level that I, I face is pretty high, but I, the commitment I make is I want to be available, and I don't want a software developer who wants to talk about some, you know, I need one more little clarification on this to wait the weekly meeting because what's going to happen between now and then i don't think that's going to be the highest productivity well yeah i was just going to say uh, tony shea talks about serendipitous collisions and they talk about when he, they designed his office for zappos in vegas that they actually closed off two of the entrances and exits to funnel everyone through one entrance and one exit and he he's a huge believer in the fact that a lot of the innovation comes from just random events people colliding together talking about a problem and solving it um I'm just going to go back to the, the, the entropy question really quickly. Uh, I just read a book uh, by Phil Knight called Shoe Dog, which is his autobiography and about the beginning of Nike. And it's one of the greatest business books I've ever read. But what his, the answer, I think, that comes out of his book, and there's so many things that happened by accident there, um, was that he didn't hire necessarily for pedigree, education, a qualification, but he hired for passion. And it was really about long distance runners and track and field people. And so there are many years when the company wasn't doing very well. I think if he'd hired, you know, a Harvard MBA, they probably would have quit and left. But they were all crazy runners. And so if you think about challenging times, in a growth company, everything's fine, right? Revenue call, cures all ills. It's really what happens when you run into real challenge and setback or you're not growing as quickly as you'd like or the market maybe does disrupt you and, and how do you handle it? And the people that stay not of, out of obligation or guilt or... Um, being resentful that they're trapped but stay because they're passionate about why they're there in the first place. In some sense, if you break through that challenge again, you come out such a resilient company. So he hires for, for, for passion and mission fit and not so much pedigree. And it's an interesting answer to the entropy question because they're not there to be stale. They're there because they have passion and that passion injects itself in the business, so. Yeah, it, it, I definitely, feel and I have a prejudice against kind of the big company mindset. Uh, we, have, we have a customer that we work with and they flat out told us we're, a high, we're in a highly regulated industry. So every decision gets the same amount of approvals as really big decisions like new product launches and that sort of thing. And they said, so just get used to the fact we're going to move really, really slow. And uh, it, it makes me worry, just speaking to the hiring, about who you bring in and where you bring them in from. And, and, you know, what is that culture of execution? Because one thing about execution, it is part of just trying things. Sometimes you need to just try things. Well, that didn't work. Try this. Well, that didn't work. Try this. Well, that, oh, and hey, look, that worked. Whereas if you have to get approvals and build a whole business case that looks rock solid to try something, it seems like you will neither innovate nor execute. Right. And we talk about today about diversity of experience, you know. Some companies really believe in, in, uh, in growing their own and, and, and the culture of doing it and then becoming someone who goes from a doer to a manager and, and versus the lateral hire. We try to hire the superstar and the backfires because of cultural issues. And so there's that great conundrum again between do you want diversity of experience, which suggests lateral hiring is a good thing, versus growing your own who grew up in the culture, earn the respect of the team and then can lead. And how do you meld the two? That, that's also really hard. That's something we actually um, do at Alexander. We have a TEC process. I think we stole it from right now, back in the day. Uh, <laughs> but we look at talent, education, slash experience, and culture. And there was even a candidate probably a month ago now. He wasn't going to be a good culture fit, but he had perfect background, perfect strengths. He'd be a great asset to the team, but he wasn't going to fit in with the team. So we had to say no, and it was a very hard decision, but we knew it was going to impact everything else we had built, so that's definitely an important portion of us being able to execute well. John, you want to surf on that? You know, I, I love the passion point. Um, I, I think that's one of the most critical uh, things that, you know, I, in the last 10 years, we've probably seen 10,000 
new product submissions, both to us directly and now we do some work for clients. And uh, the number of times that someone is successful with something that they think is a neat idea but they're not passionate about is about zero. Um, the number of times that somebody comes up with some insight that they're passionate about and their first solution doesn't work and their second solution doesn't work and their third solution doesn't work, but their fourth solution does, you, there's a lot of those out there. So passion overcomes a lot of errors. Um, and I'd hire for passion and culture fit over pedigree every day. So how might, in, I get in on passion, how might you see in the hiring process um, whether that passion is also matched by just an ability to execute? Because a passionate fan who just want, runs around waving their arms might not really be the best thing for your company either. So anyone, some tips on how do you, what might you even ask or, or, or look at in an interview process? Well, in the, in the similar example, I would be looking under talent to ask questions around, you know, what have they achieved? You know, what, what goals did they set out? What did they achieve? Whether it was in school or in a previous business setting or, you know, in their long distance running career, you know, but it's like, have they been able to follow it through and, and deliver. Yeah, because un uh, unlike mutual funds, uh, in the case of people, past performance is the best future indicator. <laughs> the, other, the other thing, uh, you know. I got one giggle were, over if there. If I were doing it over again, I would probably actually literally call it passion. I would call it, you're looking at talent, experience, and passion. I think the risk in calling it culture fit is a, lack, a little bit of a lack of diversity because it's hard to go, well, what, what do you mean, what's a culture fit? And it can mean a lot of different things, but uh, I, I think the diversity of the workforce piece is so important. I've seen that phrase turn some people off. So talent, yep. experience, and passion. Yep. Sometimes and, and, we, and we would argue you, you should never hire, so, you know, you, if you rank them, you know, one, two, three, or whatever, you, you can sacrifice on the experience because if they have the talent and they have the passion, you can train them. But you really shouldn't ever sacrifice on kind of the raw horsepower or the talent or the passion. Yeah, and I'd echo that. Sometimes hiring great passion and great talent actually helps change your culture, yep. which you sometimes need. Um, so you want to be careful not to let the, the current culture lock you in to create entropy. There's a VC uh, here that lives in Bozen lot, Tim Connors, runs a firm called Pivot North Capital and used to be at Sequoia and USCP. And he, he says endurance athletes that's who's made of money. And there's a lot to what we talked about today, right? Habit, discipline, you know, persistence, grit. Um, so he, he would tell you <laughs> the answer is, uh, do you do Iron Man? Okay, good, let's go. Uh, that's good. So what I want to do is uh, we have 16 minutes left, and I thought I have a few more questions here, but I thought I would open it up to our paying audience. And we have mics, one over there, and I think one over there. Or th is it just this one? Two of them, two mics. So uh, if you have a question, why don't you line up in front of the mics? Um, one or two people, one over there and one over there. And uh, we'll have a question. So I'm going to do one more, but you need to be jumping up and lining up for uh, some good questions. And by the way, these questions, if you want to go beyond execution and a culture of execution and tips on execution, that's just fine. We have um, a, a quite a bit of passion and talent and experience <laughs> sitting right up here. So if you are in a business, if you're an entrepreneurial uh, leader and executor within a company, feel free to get up and uh, pick some brains. So here's one for you. Seth Godin, one of his many, many books was The Dip. And he talks about, and it sort of goes to this grit and endurance, he talks about you go like this and you're going to have some brilliant new ideas, so you launch a new, launch a new initiative. Inevitably, there's a dip and then you have to go like this, and he says too many people give up in the dip, but he also says you need to know when you need to just drop it and, and quit sending those resources. So anyone have any ideas here on, uh, or, or experiences or stories about when do you have to drop it? I like, I like to, before you kind of undertake, go, you, before you begin, figure out what time frame you're going to give it. That it's like, okay, this is a six-month experiment or a six-month whatever. And, you know, you, know, you know the results or the KPIs or whatever you want to achieve. 
And so when you hit that dip, because you're right, you do hit the dip, and it's really easy to go, oh, that was a bad idea, walk away. But if you've given it six months to start with, or whatever the time frame is, maybe it's a year, maybe it's three years, you know, maybe it's two weeks, but set your time frame and then see it all the way through. Yeah, I think the challenge with giving up is that the myth of the entrepreneur is that you never give up. You know, talk about Scott Cook, who couldn't get funded by for Intuit and saw 120 venture firms, or Mark Benioff, you know, got turned down all over Sand Hill Road, and uh, it, and it's always the story about in that in that next day, you know, you know, the first purchase order came in, and and so I think as an entrepreneur, your identity is part of that. You know, you're not going to give up, and so you know the one in my experience. What I did is I, I did two things. I would set like a year out, okay, and I'd write down in stone, like if these things don't happen, you know, I'm, I'm, but I didn't want to wake up every day going, should I do it another day? Should I not do it another day? So that living with that torturing yourself, whether you should keep going or not, is, I think can really drain you of energy. So try to suspend judgment, but pick a date and then, you know, almost plant it in stone and then revisit it and be objective about it. And I think the other thing too is if you can find people that, our risk takers and entrepreneurs as mentors and advisors, and they can look at you and say, hey, this is really not working. Um, but I think that is one of the hardest things to do because so much of the myth of the entrepreneur, again, is, is the, you know, they stuck with it, it took 11 years or, you know, 10 different failures and then finally broke through. Wait, but before you go on, I don't see anyone lined. Oh, I got one lined up. Oh, I got another. Okay, so you guys go ahead. Go ahead. Because I, I was going to call on a couple people. So I think the other thing... The way that I would think about it is, why is it not working? Is it because the customers aren't showing up, or is it because your investors or the smartest people that you're asking about the idea are saying it's not a good idea? If it's not working because the customers aren't showing up, it might be time to rethink it. If it's not working because smart people are telling you it's not going to work, pff, yeah. keep going. <laughs> keep going. Your gut might be right. Yeah. Get it in front of some customers. And if they tell you, to go home, go home. Um, I just read something the other day. Abraham Lincoln lost six elections before he won the presidential election. So we're, I think, all happy that he stuck with it. <laughs> all right. Hello. Um, does the creator of the idea have to be the passionate one? Ooh. Does the creator of the idea have to be the passionate one? No, but it's really rare for it not to be the passionate one. Um, adoptive parents can be super passionate, um, but it's, it's, a, it's very tough uh, to, to get that transference to work. Um, you know, it's a case-by-case -case thing, but I would say it's, it's probably 95 to 5, 90, 10, in my experience. Susan, you're going to jump in on that? I think you need a mix of people in it for any business to be successful. And so I guess I don't, I don't see, the idea can be, be the idea and if somebody else runs with it and I think it's fine. Yeah, maybe, uh, let me clarify. I think uh, maybe it's the stage, right? I guess I'm, I'm coming at it from the inventor, really early stage perspective. If it's something inside a company or it's an ongoing company with a new management team, yeah, totally, that works. Um, so I, to clarify. Yeah. yeah, the only industry I've really seen that work in is, is, is drug development where you have a doctor at Harvard or John Hopkins who comes up with a molecule for cancer treatment and they stay on staff as researchers and then, but that, that molecule is then taken through the FDA process. But, cause that idea, that the value, the IP is in that idea, but I think a lot of us alluded to earlier in software and other things, the idea is, has marginal value. It's really the, the iteration of the idea where the value is and if the creator leaves that process, ultimately can they really claim credit to the end state because it may not resemble anything like it started at, so. All right, question over here. So for me, the question was, uh, Peter said, mentioned skating to where the puck has been, being kind of new in the startup industry. I have a tendency to do that a lot because it's easy because it's easy to say yes to that. But by the time you get there, it's already been done. And then Andrew mentioned, well, it's easy to say no to things. Well, no to all these great ideas. So the question is, what do you say yes to? There you go. It's been a hard question for me. I guess I look at the framework of 
you know, what, what can, I, I like the Jim Collins book, yeah. you know, the good to great, you know, what, what can you be best, can you be best in the world at it? You know, is, is there an economic engine? Cause we're talking, if we're talking about a business, you need to make money and you know, is it something you're passionate about and, and, you know, kind of build your decision framework then from that. And that's what you say yes to. There's an adage in VC which just says, uh, don't take technology risk, but take market risk. And the reason for that is if it's a zero billion dollar market, no big companies are really thinking about it. So that's what he kind of means by skating to where the puck is. But if you're convinced that a new market's gonna emerge and you have some differentiated edge on it, then it probably is worth saying yes to, where you, the technology is solid. You know it's gonna work. The question is, will the customers show up? By the time the other big guys realize there's a market, you may be in a good position. Whereas if you go into a market that really exists, garbage bags maybe, <laughs> um, and you have some technology that may or may not work, that's a much harder game because there's so much inertia in that market, so much brand loyalty. Um, and so uh, you know, thinking about market dynamics can be really helpful too to deciding whether it's worth the risk. The question, can I give part of the answer? Ab absolutely, Peter. One of the things that we've seen is that if you invent something and now your question is to whom can I sell it, that's, that's probably not going to work nearly as well as what Peter uh, Drucker called noticing incongruity in the world. When things don't seem to make sense, framing a question of how can we fix that without breaking that, that tends to put you ahead, tends to put you where you're skating toward the puck's going to go. And I actually have a slide of like, you know, the five questions that we've answered at various points in Salesforce that brought products to market that no one had asked for. And that even our, our best partner said, what? You know, are you guys kind of taking your eye off the ball here? But they do tend to, to take you to new ways. If, you ask, if you're answering a question that people are asking and no one seems to have an answer for it yet, your odds of actually being out there ahead are, are appreciably greater than if you've just invented a better version of what everybody currently has. So can you give us one example from Salesforce where you went out ahead and nobody was asking you for it and your partners sure. were saying what? Sure. Uh, yeah, there was a management meeting where uh, there were, at the time there were only 200 of us in a meeting that now needs a higher level of qualification to get in. We still have 1,300, but you know the company's grown a little. But Mark got up, uh, Mark Benioff got up uh, and said, "How many of you are on Facebook?" And there were a lot of blank looks in the room, myself included. We were all on LinkedIn. You know, that's that's where business people went. And he said, "I'm on Facebook. I want to see you all there. It's the future of our business." He didn't mean recreational chit chat. He meant systems that notice the behavior of participants and bring them information before they've realized they need it. So we have, to, we have to be building systems that are, in fact, one of you talked about the degree to which letting the network scale the performance instead of relying on people to figure out what's relevant, let the network itself surface the relevance. So he was talking about some of that idea. Coming into the world of business software, which you'd really never thought that way. I mean, you know, the job of applications was to answer the questions you asked. The idea that business tools would start answering questions you hadn't asked yet, that was really way ahead. And frankly, our customers didn't get, many of our best customers still don't really understand what, what we're doing there. So it's a constant educational effort. But yeah, it was definitely an answer to a question that no one was asking at the time. That, that's the product we call Chatter, in case anyone wonders. Oh, speaking of flops, we did a Super Bowl ad for Chatter. <laughs> Okay, um, the, the video on how we made the ad in such a short time turned out to be a far more useful selling tool than the Super Bowl ad, which left no one any better informed on what the heck this thing was. Yeah. Wow. Well, while we're talking about Salesforce, we should give a shout out to their V2 Mon process, which is a great tool for execution. A lot of transparency starts at Benioff, goes all the way down the, the whole company where they talk about the goals. And um, anyway, Google V2 Mom, and you can see how Salesforce executes. That's V, the number two, M-O-M. That's their, that's their kind of accountability and planning tool. And it's, it's, it's pretty cool. We uh, recently implemented something that's very similar. And it goes all the way, it starts the whole company. You know, wh what's your vision, what's your values, and, and then what are your metrics and that sort of thing. All the way down to individuals. And it has proven to be a good engagement tool for individuals because they have personal key performance indicators that they are working on for themselves. It's, it's, it's really been a cool thing. Uh, I see a question over there. Hi, my name's Karen Cooper. I'm here because I'm running for uh, political office and um, I'm planning on running my campaign as an entrepreneur and with 21st century technology. And there's so many relevant things that you guys have talked about today that applies to politics. 
Would you mind taking just a minute um, and thinking about the political campaign aspect of marketing and talk about some of the innovations you might have seen or ways that business um, can help get big ideas to politics? All we need is Peter Thiel sitting right here. <laughs> I think it's well documented the Obama campaign uh, spent a lot of time and energy uh, on targeting and understanding their, their the voter base. Um, massive operation in Chicago in the last election. Um, the drip marketing, which you know a lot more about than, than, than most of us, uh, is a huge part of politics today, touching the customer and, and, and really making sure they understand the, the positions. I think most politicians do, a, in my opinion, they, they do kind of a placeholder job in asking for your opinion. I don't know if you ever reply to a politician's email, but generally it says, like, do not reply to this email. <laughs> <laughs> so they're good at blasting you with messages, but I'm not sure they're really listening or have the tools for it. Something as simple as a Reddit upvote, downvote system for capturing feedback may be helpful. What do your constituents really care about? Um, I find, you know, I get emails from Danes, Bullock, Gianforte, everybody here, and there's not one reply that actually goes to a human that then follows up with you. Um, so I think politics probably has a lot to learn about the listening angle as opposed to the, the blasting angle. All right, I want to get you. Uh, hi, thank you. Um, Luke Miskevich with Anderson Zermulin. Um, kind of a nuts and bolts question. Your comment about keeping everyone in one office being a competitive, competitive advantage kind of piqued my interest because it seems to run counter to a lot of trends. Thoughts on flexible schedules, remote workers, um, maybe multi-office firms, best practices for managing those environments as they pertain to execution innovation. So I, I think I'm gonna get just one or two answers to that because that would be a great subject for an entire panel uh, if, if we do this again next year, because it's, uh, I mean, it's a subject that I'm passionate about and there's a lot to it. So let's, let's, go, for, let's, let's go on the um, best tip for remote workers. Let's try that. Some best practice. Um, at Workfront had invested in incredibly good live streaming capability because they have, had, uh, have offices all over the world and remote workers and lots of flexible work arrangements. But I could have a 30 minute company meeting and people could sit at their desks and watch the screens and it actually, it really worked. It's the first time I've seen it really work. I, I gotta ask for the commercial, Wh who's tech? That part I don't know. Okay. <laughs> I could certainly find out. All right. You know, I, I just wrote that down today, like why is talent and capital concentrating in fewer places? You know, actually, like, if you think about San Francisco, I think now like half of the venture dollars are still going there, despite bandwidth and connectivity and the cloud and it runs counter to the technology trends that we talked about in those giant, you know, Esker slides. So uh, there's something underneath that that's worth peeling back. I think if you think about where people can operate independently, it's generally piecemeal work where their their work is not influenced by others. I was thinking about writers. Stephen King is in Maine. Warren Buffett's in in Omaha, Nebraska. Um, they're independent entities in some sense that aren't relying on a broader team. So is the work you know, atomistic, is it, it, can you really get it done without needing other people's input or help? That's probably likely gonna be successful, but if it requires, you know, real-time involvement of others, um, being on your own is tough. Yeah, I would agree with that. We have a really collaborative culture. If you've ever seen our office over at the Cannery District, there are no individual offices, there's no cubes. We all sit together with our desks butt up, once, um, butt up to each other. But with that, we do have people who work remotely from time to time. Um, and we do have one employee who works full-time remote, but it is about enhancing the communication for that person and really making them feel as though they're in the office. So it's something we work on a day-to-day -day basis because we're so used to being able to turn around and engage and collaborate really easily with one another. And um, going forward as people are traveling or moving to different areas, that'll be something that we're working on um, and how that experience will develop over time. Martin Mikos uh, ran MySQL, I think he had 500 employees, 350 of them worked at home. And so uh, he talks about it and he says, that it, if you have 50 people in an office and one person at home, that's not gonna work. You know, if, but if you have 50 people at home, then you build a culture of collaboration from the beginning that built into that. So I think maybe you gotta think about, you know, Greenfield, are we gonna be distributed or not? 
you know, adding bolting on people that, you know, in, that are at satellites when you have a main core, I think is really hard because people like forget that they're there, you know. Uh, but if you start from the beginning as a distributed team and you really invest in that, then I think it can be successful. Yeah, I think it depends on the, the nature of the work uh, and the type of the work. I mean, the more modular it is, um, so it's handoffs versus it's collaborative problem solving or, or decision making um, or assessment of, you know, all right, we got to figure out how we're going to, you know, put together a marketing strategy. And that, that's really hard to do virtually. Um, but I think, you know, Susan hit on it, you know, facial cues, the ability to kind of uh, expand upon and, and course correct in synchronous time. So, so video chat's huge. I can't tell you how many times, you know, emails have just gotten so misinterpreted um, in terms of what was being asked for, much less, get, you know, take, even take the emotion out of it, right? Oh my God, the CEO sneezed. He wants us to build a tissue factory. Um, you know, I saw it in the email thread and he's looking for it by Friday. So, you know, hey, all hands on deck. Um, make it live, make it as video as possible. Great, last question. Hi there, I just couldn't pass up the opportunity to pick your brains, especially Susan. Um, what techniques or approaches have you used or seen that really get a team on board with a framework? I understand you always have bright, shiny people and you have systematic implementation, detail-oriented folks, but it takes everyone being in alignment and at least cooperating with the systematic um, team. So how do you ensure that success and consistency accounting for those various personalities and temperaments? Well, I, th I think Will's advice for the politicians is equally true in businesses, right? I mean, you have to make sure that you're involving, you know, it can't, it can't just be a top-down, okay, go do this, you know. You've, you've got to provide avenues for all the various members of the team to participate in kind of the, dis the decision-making and the choosing, you know. We would have a particular quarter period where it was like the, the blue sky period, and we were looking for ideas and you know, innovation or anything from, from the entire company. And then, again, distributing that, that whole TEC construct for hiring, um, we, had a, we would identify a group of, of 10 kind of high potential employees and ask them to go solve a couple issues every year. And so one, one and they came up, it was, a, it was actually the guy from, uh, who was one of our top UK salespeople, and his particular team came up with that framework for the TEC. And so it was really valuable that people were like, we hear you, we're responding to it, you know, you're part of it. Even if you don't like this particular decision, you know, your voices will be heard in the next go round. Okay. We, we built yeah. postmortems in every scrum, you know, release that we'd sit down and ask people what worked, what didn't work, same idea as Susan had and say, you know, is this framework working for you? Not only the work within the framework, but the framework itself. And sometimes you can make modifications and changes. I think if people feel heard and you debate the issue, then you move on. Uh, it's when you're not heard, I think, that people start tuning out. Okay, so I would like to thank Susan, Will, Morgan, and John for coming up and doing this panel for us. Let's hear a round of applause.